this year, I got the chance to go backstage at Rebecca Minkoff's New York Fashion Week presentation. Rebecca Minkoff is a brand that I've known and loved for years, and it really got me interested in how she started her company and grew it to where it is today. I was able to actually do a Skype call with Rebecca, so today we're gonna learn a little bit more about how she got here. Also, since this was a video call, we were relying on the internet connection, so at times the audio isn't ideal. However, the actual information is still great, and I added subtitles, so hopefully you guys can forgive the audio quality isn't exactly what I hoped. With that out of the way, let's get into the actual video. I'm a female founder, a fashion designer, and a human rights advocate. I'm sure most of you guys are familiar with her products, but in case you're new, here's a little context. Rebecca Minkoff is a global fashion brand in over 700 stores worldwide. While her brand is mainly known for handbags, they also have a wide range of clothing, shoes, and accessories. Rebecca initially began working on her designs in 2001. The company has now sold over a million bags, and by 2014 had done over $100 million in gross sales. How did you initially get started in fashion? I first got the bug when I was about eight years old. Um, I wanted this dress and I saw it in the window and I thought I had to have it and I asked my mom to buy it for me and she said no, but I'll teach you how to sew, which as an eight year old is not where you want to hear. Uh, I got the bug for sewing and I loved that I could create something out of nothing and really just fell in love with going to thrift stores, cutting up garments, making my own thing. Rebecca not only had an interest in making clothing, but also making a business out of it. You know, since I was little, whether it was making jewelry or t-shirts, I used to go to my mom. She would sell those at the flea market. Uh, this big huge flea market in San Diego and I used to go with her and then I got it in my head that I could have a table next to her stuff and sell and even though I didn't sell anything the, the preparation and, and the act of making all this jewelry and making all the t-shirts was really fun and I got others involved when it didn't sell at the flea market I took it door to door so I think I've definitely had that bug in me of loving to create things and then sell them. So how did she go from flea markets to selling a million plus bags? It all started with an I Heart New York t-shirt. After high school, she moved straight from San Diego to New York to intern for a fashion designer. When you were doing the internship, at what point did you decide you wanted to go off and start your own line? So I worked for his company for about three years, back before social media or other distracting things. The CEO would basically allow me to do my own thing once I got all my work done. Rebecca had her first taste of success after actress Jenna Elfman wore her take on an I Love New York t-shirt on The Tonight Show. In 2001, that was right as I was almost getting fired from this designer and I was doing my clothing on the side and I had made one for this actress and um, sent it to her on the 9th of September. She wore it on the 13th and Jay Leno mentioned it on TV and back then, um, you know, TV sold things and so did magazines and so... It was in magazines for months, and that's all I did for nine months was really just go down the Canal Street on my bike and negotiate with the, the vendors that sell those out of New York shirts and then come take them back and uh, cut them up, you know, make them more funky, and then resell them. So that that was nine months of, of just that shirt. But even after the popularity of that shirt, it wasn't all smooth sailing from there. It would actually be another four years until her next product really caught on. I was considering just going to be a bartender because I had done it for a party and I was like, oh my God, I made $400 in tips. Like, what am I doing trying to sell clothing? And I was yeah. kind of on the edge of giving up when I had done one bag. I had lied and told this, this actress that I designed bags and um, this website called Daily Candy wrote about it and it, it just became this like lightning bolt. And this hit bag was called the morning after bag. So this is the original style of the morning after bag. It was actually discontinued, so I found this one online, thought it would be cool to actually show it. It's a good sized bag so you can see how this became popular because it's actually pretty functional. You can keep a lot of stuff in here. So this is the bag that really caught on in 2005. Tons of celebrities were wearing this. And while you can't get this exact bag anymore, there's still a morning after bag collection inspired by the original bag that really started it all. I saw enough inbound orders that I was like, okay, I'm not gonna give up. I'm gonna see this through and, and focus on bags and just see where this takes me. From that one bag, she started designing other styles of bags and then branched off into clothing. When you first had your line, where were you selling your products? 
So there were boutiques like Chateen. Uh, there was a store called Madison, which I think still exists in um, LA. Uh, so the store Madison actually still is here in Los Angeles. So I'm gonna go inside and see if I can find any Rebecca Minkoff, see if they still sell it. Back in the early 2000s, when Rebecca was starting out, e-commerce was really just getting started and wasn't at all what it is today. So getting into these boutiques was one of the only ways to get your products out there as a new designer. Some of them are no longer even around, so if I were mm -hmm. to say them, you'd be like, huh? Mostly small stores that back then, pre-Etsy and pre, you know, the ease of manufacturing that exists for anyone to do today, you know, people were still like accepting things that were handmade, like what you'd see at an artist in sleeves and stuff like that. So it's a lot of little local boutiques. The see didn't exist then. I mean, if you go back to 2001, yeah. people were just starting to sell on e -com. Basically what this means is most stores didn't even really have their own websites yet like this. While today, anyone can set up a website and start selling something in practically a few hours. Eventually she was able to land a spot in the retail giant we all know and love, Nordstrom. And as you can imagine, it's not easy to get into these department stores Stores, let alone stay in them. What was the process like getting into the department stores? Was that really difficult at first? Yeah, I think I was lucky. The person in charge of sales at the time had uh, a very specific methodology. She said, you know, it looks sexy to be in a department store, but you have to be big enough as a brand to be able to support uh, being in one and for people to know your name. So her formula at the time was you have to be in 500 specialty stores before I'll even have a conversation with a department store. So that the person walking into the department store kind of knows or has heard your name before or has seen it somewhere else. So we waited until that happened before accepting our first department store order. And I always say to people who want to rush into that, you know, again, it seems sexy, but after the first year of the honeymoon being over and, you know, they're buying your things, they start asking for a lot from you as the designer. And I think unless you're ready as a brand to support those things, whether being part of their catalog or, you know, if you ship a box incorrectly, uh, those are all places where they can sort of start dinging you on cost. So it's a great place to be for exposure and sales, but you also be, have to be ready as a company to sort of take on the load that that can happen. Rebecca had a fresh perspective and did things differently, and it really worked to her advantage. While most brands at the time didn't engage with customers on social media, Rebecca embraced social media and actually talked to her customers. Even now, you can actually see photos of her on her account, not just product or runway photos. So we were uh, the first you know, designer brand to talk to our customer, to reach her directly, and so I think that's something we want to continue. Even though we're 15 years later, that that's still really important and um, one of the brand values and pillars that we have. Her brand started taking off really before social media was as big as it is today. One of the first ways of interacting with her customers wasn't even on social media. It was on a website called Purse Forum, which customers still use today. So I think that as each platform emerged and we could see that there was traction with our customer, we definitely uh, made it important that we communicate with her on the channel. She also decided to take a different approach from the traditional runway show and instead do a walkthrough presentation. We did our first presentation in 2009 um, and it was, you know, models not, not necessarily walking. It was a new format for us. I think we wanted to take baby steps and it was really exciting. It was really thrilling. Unlike a lot of other brands, she realized that people don't actually want to buy that abstract clothing that you see on runways and started designing what the customer actually wants for the runway. So we spent many years doing runway shows, you know, with product that was great for a runway or great for red carpet. And I think a few years ago we said, who's wearing this stuff? Let's be honest. And let's make our runway shows. See now, buy now. Let's make them into something that when you see it there, you can actually buy it and make the customer who's, you know, who's seeing all this stuff happen in real time, let's like make her happy instantly. Every year, thousands of people start companies. So I was interested to know from Rebecca, what made hers so successful? I think persistence. Um, I think prior to the invention of um, apps and clicks, people had a view of their careers as something that was a long-term goal. Um, and I think that for people that are just starting out, you can't Uber or Amazon Prime your way to success. It's hard work, it's grit, it's sweat, it's blood. And I don't know a shortcut. So I think when you don't know otherwise, you're like, okay, I'm in it to win it. I'm in it for the long haul, 15 years, 20 years, whatever it is, five years even. 
and not be like, oh my God, I have to be a Kardashian in one year or else I'm going to quit. It's clear that Rebecca's persistence has paid off, and I learned the actual passion that she has for what she does allows her to be so persistent. I think as an entrepreneur, when you have a love and a passion, every business has its ups and downs. And I think if you love something enough and you can't think of anything you'd rather be doing, that's kind of what pulls you back into it. Um, and I think that taking a step back, taking a walk, taking a break, going on a vacation, all those things kind of help re revive you in a way so that you can come at it with a fresh perspective. I think the times where I thought the worst was not taking those vacations and not, you know, stepping away and just grinding it out 80 hours a week. This is pre-children. And I think that that's not healthy for anyone and it's not healthy for how you then end up running the business. Alright, that is it for this video. I hope that you guys enjoyed. If you did enjoy this video, this is actually the fourth in a series of female founders of companies, so I'll link below the other ones if you guys want to check it out. If you liked this one, then you'll definitely like the other ones because the audio quality is like actually really good. I really tried to make up for it though with like cool visuals as much as I could, so hopefully it was still enjoyable to watch. Alright, that is it. I will see you guys in my next video. Bye!